Ms. Boyne, you're up, and Susan Stillman, you're on deck. Good morning. My name is Peg Boyne. I'm a retired IT consultant and a lifelong lifelong county resident. According to a recent Gallup poll on marijuana use among U.S. adults, it's likely that at least one of you in the Fairfax delegation is a casual pot user. So am I. I've always thought marijuana prohibition was foolish, but never really thought about fighting it. After all, I'm white, I'm middle-aged, suburban. I will always be able to buy pot from friends who work on the Hill, or at State, or at any of several D.C. law firms. I really don't have any personal stake in this debate. But I will briefly share two stories that moved me to join the fight for immediate decriminalization and eventual legalization and regulation of cannabis products. The first involves the son of a good friend of mine. He was arrested in 2010 for selling one gram of pot, about a tablespoon for the other 16 of you, uh, to another <laughs> student at Longwood College. Thanks to his mom paying an attorney thousands of dollars, the charges were dropped, but only after a three-year odyssey of pushed back court dates and most egregiously coercion to bust three other students. For those three years, he could only get jobs through friends because he didn't want to perjure himself on job applications, all of which ask about arrests and or convictions. As it turned out, He'd been the victim of another student's attempt to make her own legal nightmare go away. Assuming their experience was the norm, please think about how much time and how many tax dollars were spent seeing all of those one gram arrests through their three year life cycles, most if not all culminating in dropped charges. At least I hope they all culminated in dropped charges. If, if we're jailing people over a tablespoon of pot, justice is not being served. I call my second story the tale of two states, and it always makes me cry. <laughs> my sister-in-law and my husband's best friend both have Parkinson's disease. <sighs> Excuse me. Both of them suffer from debilitating muscle cramps insomnia, and diminished appetite. My sister-in-law is fortunate enough to live in Colorado, and she can use medical marijuana. She's a successful artist and enjoys her life. My husband's friend, on the other hand, lives here in Arlington, and he's one of the many side effects of Parkinson's is paranoia, and since marijuana is illegal, he's terrified to try it. A former athlete, he's six feet tall and weighs 140 pounds. Can we not put away the foolishness of arresting people for simple possession of marijuana? Prohibition is ineffective. Pot use has not changed in 30 years, despite billions of dollars attempting to eradicate it. It's not only a waste of everyone's time and money, but has a devastating impact on the lives of good people. Citizens should not be dragged over legal coals for three years for selling pot and they should certainly not be forbidden from seeking effective relief from a medical condition. Decriminalization and legalization are no longer radical concepts. Let's decriminalize marijuana possession in the 2014 session, and let's get the ball rolling on full legalization. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Next is Richard Kennedy, and he will be followed by Dwayne Ludwig. Hi, I'm Richard Kennedy, a retired CA analyst, Fairfax County resident since 1972. I'm here again to talk about marijuana, I hope for the last time. Uh, FYI, I do not use any drugs, including alcohol. I graduated from college in 1963 without ever hearing the word marijuana mentioned. Went back to grad school in 69 and saw lots of it. Got interested in marijuana just as a policy issue, and it was very clear then that prohibition was not working. In 31 years at CIA, I worked on a lot of issues, but none was as clear cut as this, because normally when the facts are so clear, 
there ceases to be an issue. Some of the reasons why marijuana prohibition has failed include regulation is more effective than prohibition at keeping drugs away from kids. Compared with 36 other Western countries, countries I worked on at CIA, the U.S. does very poorly at keeping our kids away from marijuana and other drugs. We do very well at keeping them away from alcohol and tobacco. Current policy sends billions of dollars a year to the Mexican cartels. There are huge racial disparities in the law enforcement. That bothers me because I was a civil rights worker in Mississippi in 1964, and I see some of the gains since then being undone by the drug laws. Uh, marijuana has some amazing medical properties. The idea that it's a gateway drug was disproved several decades ago. And finally, it's a source of revenue. New York City, which has about the same population as Virginia, their comptroller just estimated the fiscal impact of legalizing pot in New York City at $431 million a year. But the main reason why it's a failed policy is that marijuana is a much safer drug than either alcohol or tobacco. We know that tobacco kills 443,000 people a year in this country. Alcohol, about 85,000. The number of marijuana deaths is zero, or at least so close to zero that we can't detect it. And just as a side note, the Campaign for Tobacco-Free Kids says that 152,000 Virginia kids are going to die from tobacco. Not as kids, of course, but their lives will be cut short by tobacco. I'd also like to quote what the National Institute of Drug Abuse says about these three drugs. And NIDA is no friend of marijuana, but they have a chart called Commonly Abused Drugs, and they say about, for health risks, alcohol. Increased risk of injuries, violence, fetal damage, depression, neurologic deficits, hypertension, liver and heart disease, addiction, fatal overdose. Tobacco, chronic lung disease, cardiovascular disease, stroke, cancers of the uh, mouth, esophagus, and so on. And for marijuana, they simply say cough, frequent respiratory infections, and possible mental health decline. So, uh, what could you do? Well, I would hope, at a minimum, we could stop arresting people in Virginia for using the less dangerous drug. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Kennedy. Uh, Dwayne Ludwig. Uh, you're up, and Martina Lenz is on deck. My name is Dwayne Ludwig. I'm an MIT graduate and an aerospace engineer. I've lived in Virginia for 15 years and own a home in Falls Church for over 10 years. I'm also a marijuana user. My state considers me a criminal, even though what I do harms no one. Why is this a crime? I find this very perplexing because the research has been around for decades, much of it government sponsored, and the research all concludes the same way. The only true harm from the use of marijuana occurs when you get caught with marijuana. I think Peg's testimony made that very clear. Marijuana's uh, medical benefits are unimpeachable, as I trust you already know, and, and as Dick made clear. Um, I'm happy for all the states that now enable patients to uh, seek this natural medicine. Um, I certainly find it helpful when my arthritis flares up, but that is probably the most modest of its therapeutic effects. My neighbor, for example, who is also a Virginia criminal, uses a cannabis extract to prevent epileptic seizures. But medical benefits notwithstanding, the most universally understood aspect of marijuana is financial. Um, if you've followed the news of the past couple days in Colorado, you know that it's a very valuable product and today's event certainly makes give new meaning to John Denver's song Rocky Mountain High on the <laughs> uh. there we go that's the news indeed um, but today's event makes clear that Virginia has uh, many issues that could use more funding by merely decriminalizing marijuana we could free up law enforcement resources to fight real crimes clear up the court dockets to address real crimes and if legalized someday further reduce real crimes by cartels and other black market suppliers. ACLU's report from this year says that decriminalization in Virginia would save in excess of $70 million 
per year that we can use in transportation, schools, and the many other issues raised by the other speakers. If you pass the bill that I and my fellow reformers helped to craft in this session, we can raise even more funds because we propose making it a civil infraction with a $100 or $200 fine, like a parking ticket or a speeding citation. While not legalization, this is a reasonable near-term compromise because it will avoid marking people with a criminal record, which makes them better able to get jobs, which is what this life is all about, right? <laughs> In summary, I want to someday pay taxes on marijuana purchases to support my community. I want to regulate marijuana and continue to keep it away from children, just like we do with tobacco and alcohol. I want my state to stop ruining the lives of regular citizens like me who prefer to relax by smoking a completely natural plant rather than indulge in the more lethal yet legal alternatives. Please look into this issue further. Find the courage to decriminalize marijuana possession in Virginia as soon as possible because common sense will be on your side. Thank you for this Thank opportunity. You. Uh, Mr. Ludwig, uh, you're up, and uh, Edith Kelleher is on deck. <clears throat> Hello, my name is Andy Ludwig, and I'd like to discuss economic incentives and political prog progress. I bought my first house uh, about a month ago, and I'd love to see Fairfax take huge strides forward, and I think you're the right people to make this happen. Um, I'm also interested in energy and infrastructure, um, and I have a PowerPoint to go with this, which hopefully you're looking at right now. Um, I manage energy efficiency projects at George Washington University, um, changing out lights, boilers, and chillers because it makes sense in the long run. Um, I'm also interested in energy um, and um, I'm also, so on my commute to Foggy Bottom every day, I'm lucky to have access to a good transportation system. We all love our interstate system and couldn't imagine cross-country travel without it. It's a vital piece of our infrastructure, but it's being underfunded, leading to calamities like this one in Minnesota. The gas tax funds road maintenance and has stayed the same um, per gallon since 1993, while the retail price of gasoline and just about everything else has tripled. Um, so that means we're investing only about a third of what we should to maintain our roads, much less um, enough to build anything new. Meanwhile, most politicians are too afraid to support a higher tax, um, even though our taxes are 10 times less than the rest of the world when it comes to this. Unsurprisingly, Americans sometimes drive two blocks to get a coffee. You can imagine the health consequences of, of this type of action. So I urge you to have courage in your role as representatives. Um, when considering the interests of your constituents, please also think about our society in the future and the effect of our consumption. Oh, I still have 30 seconds left. So um, before I do, I'll, I'll leave you to reflect on this quote. And with my last couple of seconds, I guess I want to add a personal note uh, based on what some other people said. I have many friends who have recently come back from Iraq and Afghanistan, and they say the only thing that helps treat their PTSD without the nasty side effects is marijuana. Um, when you can get returning soldiers to relax or even laugh, it's darn close to a miracle. And I agree with those folks that it's a travesty that we've made something that's safer and less addictive than tobacco and alcohol illegal. Um, so in the spirit of Thomas Jefferson, who grew it, um, Virginia should take steps immediately to re-legalize marijuana like they've done in Colorado. Uh, remember that bridge in the beginning? That's what our marijuana laws look like right now. So thank you for taking courageous steps in the uh, t courageous steps towards progress in the coming weeks. We appreciate it. Thank you. Uh Thank you. Frederick Cassidy is next, and he will be followed by Ned Stone. Good morning, distinguished legislators. Uh, 
I'm here today with no the normal. However, I speak for myself, and also I would like to speak for the thousands of Virginia veterans that are currently living in Virginia that have returned from war and are unable to get proper treatment for their conditions. Uh, my name is Frederick C. Cassidy. I'm a retired senior master sergeant uh, with over 30 years service. I have also taught in Fairfax County Public Schools. I have also been a coach and a board of director for a local youth organization. So I have seen firsthand some of the unexpected negative consequences of marijuana prohibition. I hope that you will seriously consider reforming our current laws. Uh, I have seen too many of the negative consequences uh, because what they have done to create, what we've done is create a black market. Uh, because of that, children are able to buy marijuana in schools from their friends much more readily than if we actually had a regulated system of distribution of such a product. Uh, drug dealers do not check IDs, but ABC stores and responsible businesses do. The laws have also brought about a synthetic craze. Many of these substitutes are far more dangerous than the actual product itself. Uh, as responsible legislators, no one can keep up with all the new substances created to circumvent the law. Young people are arrested, booked, jailed, and then sent through the criminal justice system. Uh, many cannot undo the stigma of a record and have their lives and lives around them negatively impacted. Personally, I know of one such young person who chose to end his life when it seemed the world was coming down on him after being thrown out of school for possession of synthetic marijuana. My wife and I were both able to raise our children without them ever trying marijuana, and both of them do not use it currently. Marijuana is many times more available to high school students than alcohol or tobacco. And as many others have also mentioned, uh, we have our vets returning from Vietnam, or excuse me, from Iraq and Afghanistan. And uh, in order to treat their condition, uh, there's just one word that's standing in their way in our current Virginia laws, and that is the word prescribe. If that one word were changed in our current laws to recommended, our veterans could receive treatment for their PTSD. Uh, and there was some mention about what's going on in Colorado. Sean Azaridi, the Iraqi war vet with PTSD, became the first person in the United States to legally purchase marijuana. So I urge you to seriously consider any proposals that you see to reform our current laws. Thank you. Thank you. Jason Ruffner to be followed by Gene Wright. Thank you to those of you who have dutifully stuck around to uh, listen to all of us. My name is Jason Ruffin, and I'm a nut. <laughs> I address you today with passion and compassion on behalf of our Commonwealth correcting its unfortunate and misguided prohibition on the hemp and cannabis plants and regulating cannabis for purchase and consumption by adults only. No matter for now that the way cannabis became illegal has a shameful history of which no moral American should be proud. Its illegality runs contrary to the recommendations of the 1972 Schaefer Commission and has nothing to do whatsoever with science, public health, or social justice, but much to do with racial bigotry and ideological oppression. Also, let's put aside that cannabis is by any metric much less harmful to the self and to society than is alcohol, yet cannabis is governed the same as methamphetamine and heroin, while booze is advertised to kids during the Super Bowl. Further, the war on drugs is inherently unwinnable, hopelessly wasteful, while being just as deadly as any war, but that's still not really the crux of my address. Mainly, I address you, ladies and gentlemen, to speak directly to the usual straw man reaction that many in lawmaking positions resort to, that children might be harmed when we correct this prohibition. In fact, children, particularly our high schoolers, have 
disgustingly easy access to it already. Ask them and they'll tell you about the sad circumstance. This is precisely because of the item's unregulated status and drug dealers don't check IDs. If you believe this commodity ought to be absolutely illegal and this wasteful, un-American prohibition continued, you will have plenty of support from drug dealers and drug cartels. In my waiting moments, I'd like to point out that uh, nearly every one of those who've spoken today on behalf of ending cannabis prohibition are still here. So you can't tell me pop people lack motivation. <laughs> Thank you. God bless. Learn facts. Think rationally. And together, let's make things better. Good afternoon.